Adieu to a Soldier by Walt Whitman Read for LibriVox.org by Ratandeep Satwan Singh Jamshedpur, India Adieu, O Soldier, you of the rude campaigning which we shared, the rapid march, the life of the camp, the hot contention of opposing fronts, the long manoeuvre, red battles with their slaughter, the stimulus, the strong, terrific game, spell of all brave and manly hearts, the trains of time through you, and like of you all filled with war and war's expression. Adieu, dear comrade, your mission is fulfilled, but I, more warlike, myself and this contentious soul of mine still on her own campaigning bound through untried roads with ambushes opponents line through many a sharp defeat and many a crisis often baffled here marching ever marching on a war fight out i here to fiercer Vetier battles give expression. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Ballad of East and West by Rudyard Kipling. Read for LibriVox.org by Noel Badrian, County Offaly, Ireland. O oh, east is east, and west is west, and never the twain shall meet, till earth and sky stand presently at God's great judgment seat. But there is neither east nor west, border nor breed nor birth, when two strong men stand face to face, though they come from the ends of the earth. Kamal is out with twenty men to raise the border side, and he has lifted the colonel's mare that is the colonel's pride he has lifted her out of the stable door between the dawn and the day and turned the calkins upon her feet and ridden her far away then up and spoke the colonel's son that led a troop of the guides is there never a man of all my men can say where kamal hides then up and spoke mohammed khan the son of the Rasaldar if ye know the track of the morning mist ye know where his pickets are at dusk he harries the abazai at dawn he is into borer but he must go by fort buclo to his own place to fare so if ye gallop to fort buclo as fast as a bird can fly by the favour of god ye may cut him off ere he win to the tongue of jagai but if he passes the tongue of Jagai, right swiftly turn ye then, for the length and the breadth of that grisly pain is sown with Kamal's men. There is rock to the left and rock to the right, and low lean thorn between, and ye may hear a breech bolt snick where never a man is seen. The colonel's son has taken a horse, and a raw rough dun was he with the mouth of a bell and the heart of hell and the head of a gallows tree the colonel's son to the fort has won they bid him stay to eat who rides at the tail of a border thief he sits not long at his meat he's up and away from fort buclo as fast as he can fly till he was aware of his father's mare in the gut of the tongue of jagai till he was aware of his father's mare with kamal upon her back and when he could spy the white of her eye he made the pistol crack he has fired once he has fired twice but the whistling ball went wide ye shoot like a soldier kamal said show now if ye can ride it's up and over the tongue of jagai as blown dust devils go the dun he fled like a stag of ten but the mare like a barren doe the dun he leaned against the bit and slugged his head above but the red mare played with the snaffle bars as a maiden plays with a glove there was rock to the left and rock to the right and low lean thorn between 
and thrice he heard a breech bolt snick though never a man was seen they have ridden the low moon out of the sky their hoofs drum up the dawn the dun he went like a wounded bull but the mare like a new roused fawn the dun he fell at a watercourse in a woeful heap fell he and kamal has turned the red mare back and pulled the rider free he has knocked the pistol out of his hand small room was there to strive twas only by favour of mine quoth he you rode so long alive there was not a rock for twenty mile there was not a clump of tree but covered a man of my own men with his rifle cocked on his knee if i had raised my bridle hand as i have held it low the little jackals that flee so fast were feasting all in a row if i had bowed my head on my breast as i have held it high the kite that whistles above us now were gorged till she could not fly lightly answered the colonel's son do good to bird and beast but count who come for the broken meats before thou makest a feast if there should follow a thousand swords to carry my bones away belike the price of a jackal's meal were more than a thief could pay they will feed their horses on the standing crop their men on the garnered grain the thatch of the byres will serve their fires when all the cattle are slain but if thou thinkest the price be fair thy brethren wait to sup the hound is kin to the jackal spawn howl dog and call them up and if thou thinkest the price be high in steer and gear and stack give me my father's mare again and i'll fight my own way back kamal has gripped him by the hand and set him upon his feet no talk shall be of dogs said he when wolf and grey wolf meet may i eat dirt if thou hast hurt of me in deed or breath what dam of lances brought thee forth to jest at the dawn with death lightly answered the colonel's son i hold by the blood of my clan take up the mare for my father's gift by god she has carried a man the red mare ran to the colonel's son and nuzzled against his breast we be two strong men said kamal then but she loveth the younger best so she shall go with a lifter's dower my turquoise studded rein my broidered saddle and saddle cloth and silver stirrups twain the colonel's son a pistol drew and held it muzzle end ye have taken the one from a foe said he will you take the mate from a friend a gift for a gift said kamal straight a limb for the risk of a limb thy father has sent his son to me i'll send my son to him with that he whistled his only son that dropped from a mountain crest he trod the ling like a buck in spring and he looked like a lance at rest now here is thy master kamal said who leads a troop of the guides and thou must ride at his left side as shield on the shoulder rides till death or i cut loose the tie at camp and board and bed thy life is his thy fate it is to guard him with thy head so thou must eat the white queen's meat and all her foes are thine and thou must harry thy father's hold for the peace of the border line and thou must make a trooper tough and hack thy way to power belike they will raise thee to wrestle dar when i am hanged in peshawar they have looked each other between the eyes and there they found not fault they have taken the oath of the brother in blood on leavened bread and salt they have taken the oath of the border in blood on fire and fresh cut sod on the hilt and the haft of the kyber knife and the wondrous names of god the colonel's son he rides the mare and kamal's boy the dun and two have come back to fort bouclos where they went forth but one and when they drew to the quarter guard full twenty swords flew clear there was not a man but carried his feud with the blood of the mountaineer have done have done said the colonel's son put up the steel at your sides last night ye had struck at a border thief to-night tis a man of the guides 
O oh, east is east, and west is west, and never the twain shall meet, Till earth and sky stand presently at God's great judgment seat. But there is neither east nor west, border nor breed nor birth, When two strong men stand face to face, though they come from the ends of the earth. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Cool Grey City of Love by George Sterling. Read for LibriVox.org by Kurt Arthur Fieldhouse. Alternative Voices. Co. Though I die on a distant strand, and they give me a grave in that land, yet carry me back to my own city, carry me back to her grace and pity, for I think I could not rest afar from her mighty breast she is fairer than others are whom they sing the beauty of her heart is a song and a star my cool grey city of love though they tear the rose from her brow to her is ever my vow ever to her i give my duty first in rapture and first in beauty wayward passionate brave glad of the life god gave the sea winds are her kiss and the seagull is her dove. Cleanly and strong she is, my cool, grey city of love. The winds of the future wait at the iron walls of her gate, and the western ocean breaks in thunder, and the western stars go slowly under, and her gaze is ever west in the dream of her young unrest. Her sea is a voice that calls, and her star a voice above and her wind a voice on her walls, my cool, grey city of love. Though they stay her feet at the dance, in her is the far romance. Under the rain of winter falling, vine and rose will await recalling. Though the dark be cold and blind, yet her sea fog's touch is kind, and her mighty caress is joy and the pain thereof. O oh, great is thy tenderness, O oh, cool grey city of love. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Desiderium by Richard Le Gallienne. Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug. Perth, Western Australia. Face in the tomb that lies so still. May I draw near and watch you sleep and love you without word or tear? You smile, your eyelids flicker. Shall I tell how the world goes that lost you? Shall I tell? Ah, love, lift not your eyelids. Tis the same old story that we laughed at, still the same. We knew it, you and I. We knew it all. Still is the small the great, the great the small. Still the cold lie quenches the flaming truth, and still embattled age wars against youth. Yet I believe still in the ever-living God that fills your grave with perfume, writing your name in violets across the sod shielding your holy face from hail and snow and though the withered stay the lovely go no transitory wrong or wrath of things shatters the faith that each slow minute brings that meadow nearer to us where your feet shall flutter near me like white butterflies that meadow where immortal lovers meet gazing for ever in immortal eyes end of poem this recording is in the public domain epigram by alexander pope read for librivox by sean bayern in tallahassee florida my lord complains that pope stark mad with gardens has cut three trees the value of three farthings but he's my neighbor, cries the peer polite, and if he visit me, I'll waive the right. 
What, on compulsion and against my will, a lord's acquaintance? Let him file his bill. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fire and Ice by Robert Frost Read for LibriVox.org by Ratandeep Satwan Singh Jamshedpur, India Some say the world will end in fire, Some say in ice. From what I have tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to know that for destruction ice is also great and would suffice. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Gift of God by Jack London, June 1899. Read for LibriVox.org by Kurt Arthur Fieldhouse. Alternative Voices. Co. Name me the gift of God. A man commanded. His brow was furrowed with thought. He wished to know all things. There was a clamor among the peoples. Many strove to answer, and many were silent. Some did not care, yet none were too busy to listen. At first they named all things in loud voices till the weak were hushed. Then the strong ones became as one. Life is the gift of God, they cried, in a mighty chant which shook the heavens. But in time they became tired and no longer outraged the sky. Then a graybeard, doddering on the edge of his grave, raised a thin voice. He had seen three generations come and go. He knew all tricks. He said, Death is the gift of God. He knew. But the people were angry, and in a great clamor drowned his thin voice. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Grenadier by A. E. Houseman. Read for LibriVox.org by Terence Nunn. The Queen she sent to look for me. The sergeant, he did say, Young man, a soldier will you be for thirteen pence a day? For thirteen pence a day did I take off the things I wore, And I have marched to where I lie, And I shall march no more. My mouth is dry, my shirt is wet, My blood runs all away, So now I shall not die in debt For thirteen pence a day. Tomorrow after new young men, the sergeant he must see, for things will all be over then between the queen and me, and I shall have to bait my price, for in the grave, they say, is neither knowledge nor device, nor thirteen pence a day. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Horse Book by Mary Tutel Read for LibriVox.org by Julia Niedermeyer At play, three little foals you see at play, They romp and sport all through the day, But sometimes they are most sedate, And try to ape their mother's gait. They wheel and race and leap and prance, And sometimes they are set to dance, But always they will stand and stare At anyone who passes there. Schooling The horse, like us, must go to school, To learn by precept and by rule. Like us, he does not love the work. Like us, he's not allowed to shirk. This little instrument you see, stripped on his back, shaped like a V, is a dumb jockey meant to train the horse to bear the bit and rein. Cleverness. Billy, the circus pony, can distinguish letters like a man. He'll hold up for you in the ring his D for dance and K for king. With P for pony, he will show that he his family name doth know, and he will find the C for clown and at his feet will put it down. Willingness Although this horse is doing all he can to drag this heavy load up the hill, the lazy boy who is walking beside him with one hand in his pocket beats him cruelly with the stick which he carries. 
the boy is too silly or too callous to see how willingly the horse is working wilfulness a horse's great red-letter days are days of hunting when his ways are often very wilful here see this john gilpin in great fear he came out just to see the meet but the horse thought he would compete with horses hounds and fox for place and let the man this mad cape race intelligence on the prairies in the far west of america a man lost his way he had no water to drink although both he and his horse were parched with thirst not knowing where to find water he cast the reins on the neck of his horse by means of that wonderful intelligence which some people wrongly call instinct the horse found his way to a spring although it was many miles distant thus both man and horse were able to quench their thirst and in this way their lives were saved kicking these two are very much dismayed to see the fuss the horse has made because his dog in playful mood barked in a manner rather rude it is a thing some horses do until the driver makes them rue their fits of temper then they say that kicking doesn't seem to pay gentleness these big cart horses and these little children are great friends although the horses are so big they are very gentle and allow the carters children to lead them home in the evening or to ride on their backs biting peggy is the children's bride and she allows them all to ride she comes to them whenever they call and loves to have them in her stall with others she has wilful ways she will be cross with john for days will kick and squeal will show much spite and very often try to bite toiling these three horses are ploughing an upland field they are thoroughly enjoying themselves for they are so strong that the work is a pleasure to them the ploughman is guiding the plough so as to keep the furrows straight the rooks are soaring round in search of crabs found in the earth which is turned up by the plough hunting what sweeter sound on winter morn than music of the hounds and horn what prettier sight could ever be seen than hounds and horses on the green see winding down this country way an eager throng one winter day keen out a man for sport of course but just as keen each hound and horse duty the troop horse like all soldiers has to learn his drill till he becomes as efficient as his rider in war he will take his place in his squadron should his rider have been killed or wounded in one instance several guns of the royal horse artillery were saved by the teams galloping back to the lines after all the gunners and drivers had been shot down rearing rearing is an awkward vice no rider ever thinks it nice when the horse prances on two feet it's difficult to keep one's seat this lady riding in the row is a good rider you must know when on two legs her horse would soar she quickly brings him down to four sagacity there is danger at this place which the horse can see but which the rider fails to detect they are in the midst of a swamp where one false step would mean a horrible death and a quagmire on the verge of which the horse has pulled up the man uses whip and spur but the horse refuses to move finally the rider leaves the horse to himself to find a way round which brings them both to safety bolting see this runaway flecked with foam galloping fast as he can for home caring not for the shouting man running also as fast as he can flung by the bolter on the roadside small is his chance of a pleasant ride two legs matched in a race with four perhaps they'll meet at the stable door patience the cab horse is a useful steed ever handy good at need a patient uncomplaining jade what should we do without his aid by day by night he may be had be the weather good or be it bad many a knock and many a fall he gets and yet survives them all bucking when horses buck they take a bound of all their four feet off the ground unless they know just what to do and how to keep the seeds all through the riders come off fast and thick when horses start this yankee trick but with the cowboys of the west the horses come off second best perseverance the horse affords the best example amongst animals of perseverance he will go on until he falls exhausted or dead on the yorkshire moors after a heavy fall of snow the roads are quite lost and it often happens that the mailman has to unharness his horse the cart being blocked by the snow and trust to the horse's courage and endurance to carry the mails from village to village it has been known that the driver has been overcome by the intense cold when the horse has found his way unaided to the nearest accustomed stopping place chipping 
of all the tiresome steeds that are the chiba is the worst by far he stands and contemplates the scene an act embarrassing and mean and nine times out of ten he chooses an awkward spot when he refuses to move to cure him take him out and turn the chiba round about service the bus horse does not work all day for if he did he'd waste away he does his work and then is able to take a long rest in the stable when summer suns beat down upon it his head is sheltered by a bonnet and though it makes him look a duffer he hasn't half the heat to suffer shine a wicked horse perhaps you say to shine such a sudden way and almost make his rider fall it is not nice of him at all it was not wickedness but fear the dreadful white thing rushing near appeared to his affrighted eyes full seven times its proper size curiosity all horses very curious are and things which they aspire far arouse their curiosity they wonder what on earth they see with ears pricked up and cautious mien they come to see when they have seen they snort and turn and off they scurry in a contemptuous desperate hurry friendship a beautiful race-horse became very much attached to a cat so much so that he was never happy unless the cat was near him either sleeping curled up on his back or somewhere in his stall they became such close companions that when the horse was taken abroad to run in some races for which he had been entered he became so dejected at being separated from his companion that it was found necessary that the cat should always accompany him in his horse-box wherever he went old age this horse's working days are o'er the shafts and saddle never more shall hold him here he waits his end cared for by those who love to tend an old companion he may rest in his loose box or take the best of grazing which the meadows give a pensioner while he shall live end of poem this recording is in the public domain i saw the moon rise clear by thomas moore read polybevote.org by britannia a finland love song i saw the moon rise clear over hills and veils of snow nor told my fleet reindeer the track i wished to go yet quick he bounded forth for well my reindeer knew i put one path on earth the path which leads to you the gloom that winter cast how soon the heart forgets when summer brings at last her sun that never sets so dawned my love for you so fixed through joy and pain when summer sun more true twill never set again end of poem this recording is in the public domain Jabberwocky by Lewis Carroll Read for LibriVox.org by Terence Nunn T'was brillig, and the slithy toves Did gyre and gimble in the wave All mimsy with the borogoves And the momoraths outgrave Beware the jabberwock, my son The jaws that bite, the claws that catch Beware the jub jub bird and shun the frumious bander snatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand, long time the manxome foe he sought. So rested he by the tum tum tree and stood awhile in thought. And as in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whiffling through the tulgy wood and burble as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through the vorpal blade went snicker-snack. He left it dead, and with its head he went galumphing back. And hast thou slain the jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. O frabjous day, kalu kale, he chortled in his joy. T'was brillig, and the slithy toves did jar and gimble in the wave. All mimsy with the borogoves, and the mome wraths outgrabe. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Lady of Shalott by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Read for LibriVox.org by Capricia Page. 
Part One On either side the river lie Long fields of barley and of rye That clothe the wall and meet the sky, And through the field the road runs by To many-towered Camelot. And up and down the people go, Gazing where the lilies blow, Round an island there below, The island of Shalott. Willows whiten, aspens quiver, Little breezes dusk and shiver Through the wave that runs forever By the island and the river Flowing down to Camelot. Four gray walls and four gray towers Overlook a space of flowers, And the silent isle embowers The Lady of Shalott. By the margin willow veiled Slide the heavy barges trailed By slow horses, and unhailed The shallop flitteth silken sailed skimming down to Camelot. But who hath seen her wave her hand, or at the casement seen her stand? Were she known in all the land, the Lady of Shalott? Only reapers, reaping early, in among the bearded barley, hear a song that echoes cheerly from the river winding clearly down to towered Camelot. And by the moon the reaper weary, piling sheaves in uplands airy, listening whispers, "'Tis the fairy lady of Shalott." Part Two There she weaves by night and day A magic web with colors gay. She has heard a whisper say, A curse is on her if she stay To look down to Camelot. She knows not what the curse may be, And so she weaveth steadily, And little other care hath she, The lady of Shalott. And moving through a mirror clear that hangs before her all the year, shadows of the world appear. There she sees the highway near, winding down to Camelot. There the river eddy whirls, and there the surly village churls and the red cloaks of the market girls pass onward from Shalott. Sometimes a troop of damsels glad, an abbot on an ambling pad, sometimes a curly shepherd lad, or long-haired page in crimson clad goes by to towered Camelot. And sometimes through the mirror blue the knights come riding two by two. She hath no loyal knight and true, the Lady of Shalott. But in her web she still delights to weave the mirror's magic sights, for often through the silent nights a funeral with plumes and lights and music went to Camelot. Or when the moon was overhead, Came two young lovers lately wed. I am half sick of shadows, said the Lady of Shalott. Part three. A bow shot from her bower eaves. He rode between the barley sheaves. The sun came dazzling through the leaves and flamed upon the brazen greaves of bold Sir Lancelot. A red cross knight forever kneeled to a lady in his shield. That sparkled on the yellow field beside remote Shalott. The gemmy bridled glittered free, like some branch of stars we see hung in the golden galaxy. The bridle bells rang merrily as he rode down to Camelot. And from his blazoned baldric slung, a mighty silver bugle hung as he rode, his armor rung beside remote Shalott. All in the blue unclouded weather, thick jeweled shone the saddle leather. The helmet and the helmet feather burned like one burning flame together as he rode down to Camelot. As often through the purple night, below the starry clusters bright, some bearded meteor, trailing light, moves over still Shalott. His broad clear brow and sunlight glowed, on burnished hooves his war-horse trode. From underneath his helmet flowed his coal-black curls as on he rode, as he rode, down to Camelot. And from the bank and from the river he flashed into her crystal mirror. Tira Lyra by the river sang Sir Lancelot. She left the web, she left the loom, she made three paces round the room, she saw the water-lily bloom, she saw the helmet and the plume. She looked down to Camelot. Out flew the web and floated wide, the mirror cracked from side to side, the curse is come upon me, cried. 
The Lady of Shalott. Part Four. In the stormy east wind straining, the pale yellow woods were waning, the broad stream in his banks complaining heavily, the low sky raining over towered Camelot. Down she came and found a boat, beneath a willow left afloat, and round about the prow she wrote, the Lady of Shalott. And down the river's dim expanse, like some bold seer in a trance, seeing all his own mischance, with a glassy countenance did she look to Camelot. And at the closing of the day she loosed the chain, and down she lay. The broad stream bore her far away, the Lady of Shalott. Lying robed in snowy white, that loosely fell to left and right, the leaves upon her falling light, through the noises of the night she floated down to Camelot. And as the boat head wound along the willowy hills and fields among, they heard her singing her last song, the Lady of Shalott. Heard a carol, mournful, holy, chanted loudly, chanted lowly, till her blood was frozen slowly, and her eyes were darkened wholly, turned to towered Camelot. For ere she reached upon the tide the first house by the waterside, singing, in her song she died, the Lady of Shalott. Under tower and balcony, by garden wall and gallery, a gleaming shape she floated by, dead pale, between the houses high, silent, into Camelot. Out upon the wharfs they came, knight and burgher, lord and dame, and round the prow they read her name, the Lady of Shalott. Who is this, and what is here? And in the lighted palace near died the sound of royal cheer, and they crossed themselves for fear, all the knights at Camelot. But Lancelot mused a little space, he said, she has a lovely face. God in his mercy lent her grace, the Lady of Shalott. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Moon is Hiding In by E. E. Cummings. Read for LibriVox.org by Brent Rinaldi. The moon is hiding in her hair. The lily of heaven, full of all dreams, draws down. Cover her briefness in singing. Close her with intricate faint birds. By daisies and twilights deepen her. Recite upon her flesh the rain's pearls singly whispering. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Need of Being Versed in Country Things by Robert Frost Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp The house had gone to bring again to the midnight sky a sunset glow. Now the chimney was all of the house that stood, like a pistol after the petals go. The barn opposed across the way that would have joined the house in flame had it been the will of the wind was left to bear forsaken the place's name. No more it opened with all one end for teams that came by the stony road to drum on the floor with scurrying hoofs and brush the mow with the summer load. The birds that came to it through the air at broken windows flew out and in. Their murmur more like the sigh we sigh from too much dwelling on what has been. Yet for them the lilac renewed its leaf, and the aged elm, though touched with fire, and the dry pump flung up an awkward arm, and the fence post carried a strand of wire. For them there was really nothing sad, but though they rejoiced in the nest they kept, one had to be versed in country things, not to believe the Phoebes wept. 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Of the Use of Riches, an Epistle to the Right Honorable Alan Lord Bathurst, by Alexander Pope. Read for LibriVox.org by Sean Bayern in Tallahassee, Florida. Who shall decide when doctors disagree and soundest casuists doubt like you and me? You hold the word from Jove to Momus given, that man was made the standing jest of heaven, and gold but sent to keep the fools in play, for half to heap and half to throw away. But I, who think more highly of our kind, and surely heaven and I are of a mind, opine that nature, as in duty bound, deep hid the shining mischief underground. But when by man's audacious labor won, flamed forth this rival to its sire the sun, then in plain prose were made two sorts of men, to squander some, and some to hide again. Like doctors thus, when much dispute has passed, we find our tenets just the same at last, both fairly owning riches, in effect, no grace of heaven, or token of the elect, given to the fool, the mad, the vain, the evil, to ward to waters, chartress, and the devil. What nature wants, commodious gold bestows, tis thus we eat the bread another sows. But how unequal it bestows, observe, tis thus we riot, while who sow it, starve. What nature wants, a phrase I much distrust, extends to luxury, extends to lust, and if we count among the needs of life another's toil, why not another's wife? Useful, we grant, it serves what life requires, but dreadful, too, the dark assassin hires. Trade it may help, society extend, but lures the pirate and corrupts the friend. It raises armies in a nation's aid, but bribes a senate and the lands betrayed. Oh, that such bulky bribes as all might see still as of old encumbered villainy. In vain may heroes fight and patriots rave, if secret gold saps on from knave to knave. Could France or Rome divert our brave designs with all their brandies or with all their wines? What could they more than knights and squires confound? Or water all the quorum ten miles round? A statesman slumbers how this speech would spoil. Sir, Spain has sent a thousand jars of oil. Huge bales of British cloth blockade the door. A hundred oxen at your levy roar. Poor avarice one torment more would find, nor could profusion squander all in kind. Astride his cheese, Sir Morgan might we meet, and worldly, crying coals from street to street, whom, with a wig so wild and mean so mazed, pity mistakes for some poor tradesman crazed. Had Hawley's fortune lain in hops and hogs, scarce Hawley's self had sent it to the dogs. His grace will game. To whites a bull be led, with spurning heels and with a butting head. To whites be carried, as to ancient games, fair coursers, vases, and alluring dames. Shall then Uxorio, if the stakes he sweep, bear home six whores and make his lady weep? Or soft Adonis, so perfumed and fine, drive to St. James's a whole herd of swine? Oh, filthy check on all industrious skill, to spoil the nation's last great trade, quadrille. Once we confess beneath the patriot's cloak, from the cracked bag the dropping guineas spoke and jingling down the back stairs told the crew, old Cato is as great a rogue as you. Blessed paper credit that advanced so high shall lend corruption lighter wings to fly. Gold imped with this may compass hardest things, may pocket states or fetch or carry kings. A single leaf may waft an army o'er, or ship off senates to some distant shore. A leaf like Sibyl, scattered to and fro, our fates and fortunes as the wind shall blow. Well then, since with the world we stand or fall, come, take it as we find it, gold and all. What riches give us, let us first inquire? Meat, fire, and clothes. What more? Meat, clothes, and fire. Is this too little? Would you more than live? Alas, tis more than Turner finds they give. Alas, tis more than all his visions past, unhappy Wharton, waking, found at last. What can they give? To dying Hopkins, heirs? 
to chartress vigor jaffet nose and ears can they in gems bid pallid hippia glow in fulvia's buckleys the throbs below or heal old narcissus thy obscener ale with all the embroidery plastered at thy tail they might were harpax not too wise to spend give harpax self the blessing of a friend or find some doctor that would save the life of wretched shylock spite of shylock's wife but thousands die without or this or that die and endow a college or a cat to some indeed heaven grants the happier fate to enrich a bastard or a son they hate perhaps you think the poor might have their part bond damns the poor and hates them from his heart the grave sir gilbert holds it for a rule that every man in want is knave or fool god cannot love says blunt with lifted eyes the wretch he starves and piously denies but reverend sutton with a softer air admits and leaves them providence's care yet to be just to these poor men of pelf each does but hate his neighbor as himself damned to the mines an equal fate betides the slave that digs it and the slave that hides who suffer thus mere charity should own must act on reasons powerful though unknown some war some plague some famine they foresee some revelation hid from you and me why shylock wants a meal the cause is found he thinks a loaf will rise to fifty pound what made directors cheat in south sea year to live on venison when it's sold so dear ask you why phryne the whole auction buys phryne foresees a general excise why she and lesbia raise that monstrous sum alas they fear a man will cost a plum wise peter sees the world's respect for gold and therefore hopes this nation may be sold glorious ambition peter swell thy store and be what rome's great didius was before the crown of poland venal twice an age to just three millions stinted modest gauge but nobler scenes maria's dreams unfold hereditary realms and worlds of gold congenial souls whose life one avarice joins and one fate buries in the historian minds much injured blunt why bears he britain's hate a wizard told him in these words our fate at length corruption like a general flood so long by watchful ministers withstood shall deluge all and avarice creeping on spread like a low-born mist and blot the sun statesman and patriot ply alike the stocks pierce and butler share alike the box the judge shall job the bishop bite the town and mighty dukes pack cards for half a crown see britain sunk in lucre's sordid charms and france revenged of anne and edward's arms no poor court badge great scrivener fired thy brain no lordly luxury no city gain but twas thy righteous end ashamed to see senates degenerate patriots disagree and nobly wishing party rage to cease to buy both sides and give thy country peace all this is madness cries a sober sage but who my friend has reason in his rage the ruling passion be it what it will the ruling passion conquers reason still less mad the wildest whimsy we can frame than even that passion if it has no aim for though such motives folly you may call the folly's greater to have none at all hear then the truth tis heaven each passion sends and different men directs to different ends extremes in nature equal good produce extremes in man concur to general use ask we what makes one keep and one bestow that power who bids the ocean ebb and flow bids seed time harvest equal course maintain through reconciled extremes of drought and rain builds life on death on change duration founds and gives the eternal wheels to know their rounds riches like insects when concealed they lie wait but for wings and in their season fly who sees pale mammon pine amidst his store sees but a backward steward for the poor this year a reservoir to keep and spare the next a fountain sprouting through his air 
in lavish streams to quench a country's thirst and men and dogs shall drink him till they burst old kata shamed his fortune and his birth yet was not kata void of wit or worth what though the use of barbarous spits forgot his kitchen vied in coolness with his grot his court with nettles moat with cresses stored with soups unbought and salads blessed his board if kata lived on pulse it was no more than brahmins saints and sages did before to cram the rich was prodigal expense and who would take the poor from providence like some lone chartreuse stands the good old hall silence without and fasts within the wall no raftered roofs with dance and tabor sound no noontide bell invites the country round tenants with sighs the smokeless towers survey and turn the unwilling steeds another way benighted wanderers the forest o'er curse the safe candle and an opening door while the gaunt mastiff growling at the gate affrights the beggar whom he longs to eat not so his son he marked this oversight and then mistook reverse of wrong for right for what to shun will no great knowledge need but what to follow is a task indeed what slaughtered hecatombs what floods of wine fill the capacious squire and deep divine yet no mean motive this profusion draws his oxen perish in his country's cause tis the dear prince sir john that crowns thy cup and zeal for his great house that eats thee up the woods recede around the naked seat the sylvans groan no matter for the fleet next goes his wool to clothe our valiant bands last for his country's love he sells his lands bankrupt at court in vain he pleads his cause his thankless country leaves him to her laws the sense to value riches with the art to enjoy them and the virtue to impart not meanly nor ambitiously pursued not sunk by sloth nor raised by servitude to balance fortune by a just expense join with economy magnificence with splendor charity with plenty health oh teach us bathurst yet unspoiled by wealth that secret rare between the extremes to move of mad good nature and of mean self-love to want or worth well weighed be bounty given and ease or emulate the care of heaven whose measure full or flows on human race mends fortune's fault and justifies her grace wealth in the gross is death but life diffused as poison heals in just proportion used in heaps like ambergris a stink it lies but well dispersed is incense to the skies who starves by nobles or with nobles eats the wretch that trusts them and the rogue that cheats is there a lord who knows a cheerful noon without a fiddler flatterer or buffoon whose table wit or modest merit share unelbowed by a gamester pimp or player who copies yours or oxford's better part to ease the pressed and raise the sinking heart where he shines o oh, fortune gild the scene and angels guard him in the golden mean their english bounty yet a while may stand and honor linger ere it leaves the land but all our praises why should lords engross rise honest muse and sing the man of ross pleased vega echoes through her winding bounds and rapid severn hoarse applause resounds who hung with woods yon mountain's sultry brow from the dry rock who bade the waters flow not to the skies in useless columns tossed or in proud falls magnificently lost but clear and artless pouring through the plain health to the sick and solace to the swain whose causeway parts the vale with shady rose whose seats the weary traveller repose who feeds yon almshouse neat but void of state where age and want sit smiling at the gate who taught that heaven-directed spire to rise 
the man of ross each lisping babe replies behold the market-place with poor o'erspread the man of ross divides the weekly bread him portioned maids apprenticed orphans blessed the young who labor and the old who rest is any sick the man of ross relieves prescribes attends the medicine makes and gives is there a variance enter but his door balked are the courts and contest is no more despairing quacks with curses fled the place and vile attorneys now a useless race thrice happy man enabled to pursue what all so wish but want the power to do oh say what sums that generous hand supply what minds to swell that boundless charity of debt and taxes wife and children clear this man possessed five hundred pounds a year blush grandeur blush proud courts withdraw your blades ye little stars hide your diminished rays and what no monument inscription stone his race his form his name almost unknown who builds a church to god and not to fame will never mark the marble with his name go search it there where to be born and die of rich and poor makes all the history enough that virtue filled the space between proved by the ends of being to have been when hopkins dies a thousand lights attend the wretch who living saved a candle's end shouldering god's altar a vile image stands belies his features nay extends his hands that live-long wig which gorgon's self might own eternal buckle takes in parian stone behold what blessings wealth to life can lend and see what comfort it affords our end in the worst inn's worst room with mat half hung the floors of plaster and the walls of dung on once a flock bed but repaired with straw with tape tied curtains never meant to draw the georgian garter dangling from that bed where tawdry yellow strove with dirty red great villers lies alas how changed from him that life of pleasure and that soul of whim gallant and gay in cliveden's proud alcove the bower of wanton shrewsbury and love or just as gay at council in a ring of mimic statesmen and the merry king no wit to flatter left of all his store no fool to laugh at which he valued more there victor of his health of fortune friends and fame this lord of useless thousands ends his grace's fate sage cutler could foresee and well he thought advised him live like me as well his grace replied like you sir john that i can do when all i have is gone resolve me reason which of these is worse want with a full or with an empty purse thy life more wretched cutler was confessed arise and tell me was thy death more blessed cutler saw tenants break and houses fall for very want he could not build a wall his only daughter in a stranger's power for very want he could not pay a dower a few gray hairs his reverend temples crowned twas very want that sold them for two pound what even denied a cordial at his end banished the doctor and expelled the friend what but a want which you perhaps think mad yet numbers feel the want of what he had cutler and brutus dying both exclaim virtue and wealth what are ye but a name say for such worth are other worlds prepared or are they both in this their own reward that knotty point my lord shall i discuss or tell a tale a tale it follows thus where london's column pointing at the skies like a tall bully lifts the head and lies there dwelt a citizen of sober fame a plain good man and balaam was his name religious punctual frugal and so forth his word would pass for more than he was worth one solid dish his weekday meal affords an added pudding solemnized the lords constant to church and change his gains were sure his givings rare save farthings to the poor the devil was piqued such saintship to behold and longed to tempt him like good job of old but satan now is wiser than of yore and tempts by making rich not making poor 
roused by the prince of air the whirlwinds sweep the surge and plunge his father in the deep then full against his cornish lands they roar and two rich shipwrecks bless the lucky shore sir balam now he lives like other folks he takes his chirping pint and cracks his jokes live like yourself was soon my lady's word and lo two puddings smoked upon the board asleep and naked as an indian lay an honest factor stole a gem away he pledged it to the knight the knight had wit so kept the diamond and the rogue was bit some scruple rose but thus he eased his thought i'll give now sixpence where i gave a groat where once i went to church i'll now go twice and am so clear too of all other vice the tempter saw his time the work he plied stocks and subscriptions poured on every side and all the demon makes his full descent in one abundant shower of cent per cent sinks deep within him and possesses whole then dubs director and secures his soul behold sir balam now a man of spirit ascribes his gettings to his parts and merit what late he called a blessing now was wit and god's good providence a lucky hit things changed their titles as our manners turn his counting-house employed the sunday morn seldom at church twas such a busy life but duly sent his family and wife there so the devil ordained one christmas tide my good old lady catched a cold and died a nymph of quality admires our knight he marries bows at court and grows polite leaves the dull sits and joins to please the fair the well-bred cookles in st james's air first for his son a gay commission buys who drinks whores fights and in a duel dies his daughter flaunts a viscount's tawdry wife she bears a coronet and pox for life in Britain's Senate he a seat obtains, and one more pensioner since Stephen gains. My lady falls to play, so bad her chance, he must repair it, takes a bribe from France. The house impeach him, Corningsby harangues, the court forsakes him, and Sir Balam hangs. Wife, son, and daughter, Satan are thy prize, and sad Sir Balam curses God and dies. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. On His Blindness by John Milton Read for LibriVox.org by Capricia Page When I consider how my light is spent, Ere half my days in this dark world and wide, And that one talent, which is death to hide, Lodged with me useless, though my soul more bent To serve therewith my Maker, and present my true account, Lest he returning chide, Doth God exact day labor like denied, I fondly ask? But patience, to prevent that murmur, soon replies. God doth not need either man's work or his own gifts. Who best bear his mild yoke, they serve him best. His state is kingly, thousands at his bidding, Speed and post or land and ocean without rest. They also serve, who only stand, and wait. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Il Penseroso by John Milton. Read for LibriVox.org by Cynthia Moyer. Hence vain deluding joys, the brood of folly without father bred how little you bestead or fill the fixed mind with all your toys dwell in some idle brain and fancies fond with gaudy shapes possess as thick and numberless as the gay moths that people the sunbeams or like hovering dreams the fickle pensioners of morpheus train but hail thou goddess sage and holy hail divinest melancholy whose saintly visage is too bright to hit the sense of human sight and therefore to our weaker view o'erlaid with black stayed wisdom's hue black but such as in esteem prince memnon's sister might beseem or that starred ethiop queen that strove 
to set her beauty's praise above the sea nymphs and their powers offended yet thou art higher far descended the bright-haired vesta long of yore to solitary saturn bore his daughter she in saturn's reign such mixture was not held a stain oft in glimmering bowers and glades he met her and in secret shades of woody ida's inmost grove while yet there was no fear of jove come pensive nun devout and pure sober steadfast and demure all in a robe of darkest grain flowing with majestic train and sable stole of cypress lawn over thy decent shoulders drawn come but keep thy wonted state with even step and musing gait and looks commercing with the skies thy rapt soul sitting in thine eyes there held in holy passion still forget thyself to marble till with a sad leaden downward cast thou fix them on the earth as fast and join with thee calm peace and quiet spare fast that oft with gods doth diet and hears the muses in a ring i round about jove's altar sing and add to these retired leisure that in trim gardens takes his pleasure but first and chiefest with thee bring him that yon soars on golden wing guiding the fiery wheeled throne the cherub contemplation and the mute silence hissed along less philomel will deign a song in her sweetest saddest plight smoothing the rugged brow of night while cynthia checks her dragon yoke gently o'er the accustomed oak sweet bird that shunst the noise of folly most musical most melancholy the chantress oft the woods among i woo to hear thy even song and missing thee i walk unseen on the dry smooth shaven green to behold the wandering moon riding near her highest noon like one that had been led astray through the heaven's wide pathless way and oft as if her head she bowed stooping through a fleecy cloud oft on a plat of rising ground i hear the far-off curfew sound over some wide watered shore swinging slow with sullen roar or if the air will not permit some still removed place will fit where glowing embers through the room teach light to counterfeit a gloom far from all resort of mirth save the cricket on the hearth or the bellman's drowsy charm to bless the doors from nightly harm or let my lamp at midnight hour be seen in some high lonely tower where i may oft outwatch the bear with thrice great hermes or unsphere the spirit of plato to unfold what worlds or what vast regions hold the immortal mind that hath forsook her mansion in this fleshly nook and of those demons that are found in fire air flood or underground whose power hath a true consent with planet or with element sometime let gorgeous tragedy in sceptred pall come sweeping by presenting thebes or pelops line or the tale of troy divine or what though rare of later age ennobled hath the buskined stage but o oh, sad virgin that thy power might raise musaeus from his bower or bid the soul of orpheus sing such notes as warbled to the string drew iron tears down pluto's cheek and made hell grant what love did seek or call up him that left half told the story of cambuscan bold of campbell and of alger Syph, and who had canachy to wife that owned the virtuous ring and glass and of the wondrous horse of brass on which the tartar king did ride and if aught else 
great bards beside in sage and solemn tunes have sung of tourneys and of trophies hung of forests and enchantments drear where more is meant than meets the ear thus night oft see me in thy pale career till civil suited morn appear not tricked and frounced as she was wont with the attic boy to hunt but kerchiefed in a comely cloud while rocking winds are piping loud or ushered with a shower still when the gust hath blown his fill ending on the rustling leaves with minute drops from off the eaves and when the sun begins to fling his flaring beams me goddess bring to arched walks of twilight groves and shadows brown that sylvan loves of pine or monumental oak where the rude axe with heaved stroke was never heard the nymphs to daunt or fright them from their hallowed haunt there in close covert by some brook where no profaner eye may look hide me from day's garish eye while the bee with honeyed thigh that at her flowery work doth sing and the waters murmuring with such consort as they keep entice the dewy feathered sleep and let some strange mysterious dream wave at his wings in airy stream of lively portraiture displayed softly on my eyelids laid and as i wake sweet music breathe above about or underneath sent by some spirit to mortals good or the unseen genius of the wood but let my due feet never fail to walk the studious cloisters pale and love the high embowed roof with antic pillars massy proof and storied windows richly dight casting a dim religious light there let the pealing organ blow to the full-voiced choir below in service high and anthems clear as may with sweetness through mine ear dissolve me into ecstasies and bring all heaven before mine eyes and may at last my weary age find out the peaceful hermitage the hairy gown and mossy cell where i may sit and rightly spell of every star that heaven doth show and every herb that sips the dew till old experience do attain to something like prophetic strain these pleasures melancholy give and i with thee will choose to live end of poem this recording is in the public domain pink dominoes by rudyard kipling read for librivox.org by noel badrian county offaly ireland they are fools who kiss and tell wisely has the poet sung man may hold all sorts of posts if he'll only hold his tongue jenny and me were engaged you see on the eve of the fancy ball so a kiss or two was nothing to you or any one else at all jenny would go in a domino pretty and pink but warm while i attended clad in a splendid austrian uniform now we had arranged through notes exchanged early that afternoon at number four to waltz no more but to sit in the dusk and spoon i wish you to see that jenny and me had barely exchanged our troth so a kiss or two was strictly due by from and between us both when three was over an eager lover i fled to the gloom outside and a domino came out also whom i took for my future bride that is to say in a casual way i slipped my arm around her with a kiss or two which is nothing to you and ready to kiss i found her she turned her head and the name she said was certainly not my own but ere i could speak with a smothered shriek she fled and left me alone then jenny came 
and I saw with shame she doffed her domino, and I had embraced an alien waist, but I did not tell her so. Next morn I knew that there were two dominoes pink, and one had cloaked the spouse of Sir Julian House, our big political gun. Sir J was old, and her hair was gold, and her eye was a blue cerulean. And the name, she said, when she turned her head, was not in the least like Julian. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 116 by William Shakespeare Read for LibriVox.org by April Gonzalez in Cavita, Philippines Let me not to the marriage of true minds Admit impediments Love is not love, which alters when alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is enough a fixed mark, that lurks on tempest, and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark, whose words are known, although his height be taken. Love's not time's fall, though rosy lips and cheeks, within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with its brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be error, and upon me proved, and never writ, nor no man never loved. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Stanzas for the Times by John Greenleaf Whittier Read for LibriVox.org By Cynthia Moyer Is this the land our fathers loved, The freedom which they toiled to win? Is this the soil whereon they moved? Are these the graves they slumber in? Are we the sons by whom are born The mantles which the dead have worn? And shall we crouch above these graves with craven soul and fettered lip, yoke in with marked and branded slaves, and tremble at the driver's whip, bend to the earth our pliant knees, and speak but as our masters please? Shall outraged nature cease to feel? Shall mercy's tears no longer flow? Shall ruffian threats of cord and steel, The dungeon's gloom, the assassin's blow, Turn back the spirit, roused to save The truth, our country, and the slave? Of human skulls that shrine was made Round which the priests of Mexico Before their loathsome idol prayed, Is freedom's altar fashioned so? and must we yield to freedom's god as offering meat the negro's blood shall tongue be mute when deeds are wrought which well might shame extremest hell shall free men lock the indignant thought shall pity's bosom cease to swell shall honour bleed shall truth succumb shall pen and press and soul be dumb? No, by each spot of haunted ground, Where freedom weeps her children's fall, By Plymouth's rock and Bunker's mound, By Griswold's stained and shattered wall, By Warren's ghost, by Langdon's shade, By all the memories of our dead, By their enlarging souls which burst the bands and fetters round them set, by the free pilgrim spirit nursed within our inmost bosoms yet, by all above, around, below, be ours the indignant answer, no, no, guided by our country's laws for truth and right and suffering man, be ours to strive in freedom's cause, as Christians may, as free men can, still pouring on unwilling ears that truth oppression only fears. What, shall we guard our neighbour still while woman shrieks beneath his rod, and while he tramples down at will the image 
of a common god shall watch and ward be round him set of northern nerve and bayonet and shall we know and share with him the danger and the growing shame and see our freedom's light grow dim which should have filled the world with flame and writhing feel where'er we turn a world's reproach around us burn is't not enough that this is born and asks our haughty neighbour more must fetters which his slaves have worn clank round the yankee farmer's door must he be told beside his plough what he must speak and when and how must he be told his freedom stands on slavery's dark foundations strong on breaking hearts and fettered hands on robbery and crime and wrong that all his fathers taught is vain that freedom's emblem is the chain its life its soul from slavery drawn false foul profane go teach as well of holy truth from falsehood born of heaven refreshed by airs from hell of virtue in the arms of vice of demons planting paradise rail on then brethren of the south ye shall not hear the truth the less no seal is on the yankee's mouth no fetter on the yankee's press from our green mountains to the sea one voice shall thunder we are free end of poem this recording is in the public domain the two songs by william blake recorded for LibriVox.org by britannia i heard an angel singing when the day was bringing mercy pity and peace are the world's release so we sang all day over the new mown hay till the sun went down and the haycocks stood brown i heard a devil curse over the heath and the furse mercy would be no more if there were nobody poor and pity no more could be if all were happy as ye and mutual fear brings peace miseries increase our mercy pity and peace at his curse the sun went down and the heavens gave a frown end of poem this recording is in the public domain waiting by mung hajan translated by herbert a giles read for LibriVox.org by winston tharp the sun has sunk behind the western hill and darkness glides across the vale below between the firs the moon shines cold and chill no breezes whisper to the streamlet's flow belated woodsmen homeward hurry past birds seek their evening refuge in the tree o oh, my beloved wilt thou come at last with lute among the flowers i wait for thee End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Wald Einsamkeit by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug, Perth, Western Australia. I do not count the hours I spend in wandering by the sea. The forest is my loyal friend. Like God, it useth me. In plains that room for shadows make of skirting hills to lie, Bound in by streams which give and take their colours from the sky, Or on the mountain crest sublime, or down the oakened glade, Oh, what have I to do with time, for this the day was made? Cities of mortals, woe begone, fantastic care derides, but in the serious landscape lone stern benefit abides sheen will tarnish honey cloy and merry is only a mask of sad but sober on a fund of joy the woods at heart are glad 
There the great planter plants of fruitful worlds the grain, and with a million spells enchants the souls that walk in pain. Still on the seeds of all he made the rose of beauty burns, through times that wear and forms that fade immortal youth returns the black ducks mounting from the lake the pigeon in the pines the bittern's boom a desert make which no false art refines down in yon watery nook where bearded mists divide the grey old gods whom chaos knew the sighs of nature hide aloft in secret veins of air blows the sweet breath of song oh few to scale those uplands dare though they to all belong see thou bring not to field or stone the fancies found in books leave author's eyes and fetch your own to brave the landscape's looks and if amid this dear delight my thoughts did home rebound i well might reckon it a slight to that high cheer i found Oblivion here thy wisdom is, thy thrift, the sleep of cares, for a proud idleness like this crowns all thy mean affairs. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.